Andy Fletcher is the author of the book Life, the Universe, and Everything. And Andy also travels internationally, speaking in high schools all over the world on the same subject. Andy, thank you for being here. What is Life, the Universe, and Everything all about? It's based on a series of seminars that I've been doing for a long time in high schools uh, around the U.S. and around the world. Um, and, uh, and it's pretty much what it says, Life, the Universe, and Everything, which of course I stole from Douglas Adams, shamelessly. Um, but, uh, and without apology. But um, essentially what it is, I would say, is an attempt to demonstrate to students that what they think they understand about the universe uh, is just not the case. Um, and that really is the ultimate goal, I think, to show people that the universe is far stranger than we can ever possibly imagine uh, and far different than we really think it is. So why is this important? Um, it's important because within the science community, we've got ourselves stuck in, a, in an epistemological sort of sense and, and a certain way of acquiring knowledge, uh, which is not to denigrate the, the scientific method in any sense, but to say that we've made assumptions that are Newtonian assumptions about the way the universe is put together uh, that we have since discovered within science itself, courtesy of Albert Einstein and Werner Heisenberg and Max Planck and, and on and on and on, that the universe is really not uh, bound by the, the structure that we've built around it. I'm talking to kids uh, who have yet to decide what they're going to do with their lives. Some of them are going to be scientists. All of them are going to be uh, bright explorers of, of life and the universe and everything. Five, negative two, negative uh, and this may be sound a little arrogant, but who, who, need a little, who need a radical shift in the way that they look at the world of science, the world of nature, and the world. Uh, around us, the universe around us. So much of what you talk about points to some kind of a designer, some kind of a prime mover. Yeah. Um, and yet it seems that some of your biggest critics are people from the faith-based community who you would expect would, would support what you're teaching. Um, why do you suppose that is? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I end up being on thin ice in all directions. Um, religious schools particularly the schools that like intelligent design, that like uh, creationism, that like a uh, young earth, uh, like a young universe, they don't like what I do um, because I'm old earth, I'm old universe, I'm Big Bang friendly. In fact, I'm just completely in love with Big Bang. They don't know the history. Uh, they don't know uh, the struggle that science has had over these questions and continues to have. And so uh, religious girls, schools in, in particular, uh, schools that are, are Christian um, have some struggles with it. And really we're not talking about religion here, and, and that's a very clear distinction to make, is we're not talking about any religion in particular. I could, I could just pretend like it's not an issue. The problem is when you do that, that kids bring it up anyway. Um, I have felt all the way along it's better just to throw it out there and say, okay, here's what science is talking about. Science is talking about Big Bang. It's talking about relativity, general and special relativity. It's talking about an expanding universe that's expanding more rapidly than it did before. And in talking about all these forces, the question is going to come, where do they come from? Have they always existed? Well, the problem with them always existing is that nothing has always existed. So the, answer be, be, uh, the question becomes at that point, why is there anything at all? Why did the universe do anything? How did the universe arrive? Well, it arrived with Big Bang. Well, why did it do that? Well, we don't know why it did that, but having done that, it had to arrive in a, in a specific sort of way, and very specific things had to happen, and they did happen, and we know how they happened. We know more about how the universe arrived than we know about the deepest parts of the ocean. I mean, two questions that started all off. Why is there a universe at all? And now that you've got one, why isn't it just a great big empty place? It all happened. Um, and those, those questions second. point, they point second, in the direction of their being, that, that we are part of something that is bigger than ourselves. Right and what we do, all we do is say, here is the science. And then those questions arrive from the kids. And then we let the scientists themselves answer the question. So are we talking about intelligent design here? It really isn't. I really don't talk about evolution at all. I don't talk about intelligent design at all. I don't uh, really talk about a designer in any sense. Um, the fascinating thing is that when you talk about relativity and Big Bang and quantum mechanics and chaos and complexity, that the kids arrive with these questions themselves. And sometimes they go in those directions, uh, wanting me to say, okay, here's what we're talking about. But in fact, that's not what we're talking about. Um, what we're really talking about and, uh, and when you get into the final sessions is, 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 is order and structure that emerges from the universe uh, 
uh, according to the to the laws of physics, according to the rules that have have that arrived with the universe, and the forces of nature that arrive with the universe, and then the forces that we've discovered that sort of emerge from those. So it's much more of an, of an emergent thing than it is a designed thing. What's interesting to me is that you are using conventional science, and you're you're talking about conventional scientists to show some of the flaws in conventional science. It is conventional science. Um, I mean, I start with uh, a little bit of Newtonianism, and we, we don't talk about the science so much, but we talk about Newton and, and his era and the, and the insights that he and his colleagues had about the way the universe was put together based upon what they had discovered about the universe. Laws, rules, uh, equations, formula that would allow them to make predictions and observations about the universe that we're, we're still using, that are still fascinating uh, and, and still vital, they're still vitally important. Uh, but that was back in the 1600s, 1700s. There was an astronomer whose name escapes me, Simon somebody or other, in 1888, 1888, who said, we're done with astronomy. We basically discovered everything. And in 1888, all we knew was that there was one galaxy with stars in it. And everything that we knew in the universe was that galaxy and those stars, and that was the entire universe. Um, and of course, you know, by 1929, we had discovered the universe was far bigger than we could possibly imagine. There were other galaxies and, uh, and you know, all these extraordinary things. So, the, you know, and, and you, you could say, okay, well then science changed. Well, the interesting thing is that although the science itself has changed since then, we've made all these new discoveries with relativity and Big Bang and quantum mechanics and all the things that those mean, that we, we didn't really change our mindset with regard to the way we look at the universe. We still kind of have a Newtonian mindset. We assume that things are going to be predictable. This underlies, for example, a lot of the problem we're having with global warming, with the debate over global warming right now, is that both sides want things to be completely predictable. Is it happening? Certainly it's happening. Is it not happening? Certainly it's not happening. So they stand on opposite sides of the ocean and throw things at, at each other. And in essence, really, when you get down to looking at global warming, taking off those Newtonian, Newtonian sort of predictability, mechanistic kind of, kind of, kind of thoughts and, and processes that go into the, what you really understand is that weather is fundamentally unpredictable. And if weather is fundamentally unpredictable, then it's really hard for anybody to say, pro or con, exactly what's going to happen. What has been the response to your seminars and books? Um, people are nervous about talking about science and any sort of a God thing going on in the same context. So I have schools that are very, very nervous about that, schools that won't invite me in. But the schools that do um, are normal, regular old high schools. In fact, international baccalaureate high schools have this international curriculum with people from all races and all backgrounds and all creeds and all belief systems. Um, and, uh, and the teachers love what it does to the, to the students. It loves what it does to their classes. It animates them. It energizes them. They talk about it for days, weeks, months. They even talk about it for years afterwards. I'll have people come back saying, I was in one of your seminars, and, and, uh, and it was just so much fun. So I think there's been a lot, of, a lot of great success. The DVD series and the book are available at Andy's website, or if you would like to have him come and give the lecture live, you can reach him at tokseminars.org.